My name is Blake Moore, natural resources and horticulture agent. Hey, I'm Dan Severson, ag agent. I'm Jake Jones, Kent County ag agent. And I'm Katie Young, digital content specialist. Welcome to Extension 302. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Extension 302. Today, Dan, Blake, and I are excited to be joined by Ed Usset, all the way from Minnesota. Ed is the grain marketing economist for the Center for Farm Financial Management at the University of Minnesota. He has developed workshops, online marketing education games, and authored multiple books to help improve the marketing skills of grain producers. Ed was a presenter at Delaware Ag Week in 2020, and we are happy to have him back to help us and our listeners understand some basics of grain marketing and the most common mistakes that he's seen. Hi, Ed, and welcome to the show. Hello to you. Hello to uh, Dan and Blake, and thank you for having me on. Hey, Dr. Asset, this is Dan. So we usually do an icebreaker to get everything going so everybody's on, you know, just a little bit relaxed. I've been to Minnesota once. I went out there to look at some cows. It was... I don't even know if it was winter, but just say late fall. And the thermometer was like already below zero. That's not counting the wind chill. That's the the worst cold I ever felt in my life. What's the worst cold you've ever felt? And was it in Minnesota as well? Well, it was. And uh, we get cold here. And, uh, you know, you've got to man up if you want to live in Minnesota. (laughs) We have all four seasons, and I'm going to surprise you and tell you that uh, I love winter, and uh, I love to ski, particularly Nordic skiing, Uh, you know, uh, not downhill, but Nordic skiing. My wife and I are avid skiers, and, uh, you know, I've been out there at 5, 10 below zero. It gets pretty rough, pretty uh, unpleasant at those levels. But by God, if you're going to live in Minnesota, you get out and you do it because uh, there's no other way. You can't, uh, if, you, if you're a person who can't stand the cold, you shouldn't live here because you're just going to stay indoors for five months. You shouldn't do that. Get out there. I agree. It's cold there. I'd probably be one of the ones staying inside five months. I can't deny it. I'm a warm weather man. Well, wait, wait. I, I love having all four seasons. And uh, as we get started here, I have to make one small correction. Uh, you referred to me as Dr. Us, and uh, I do not have a PhD. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, you know, a, I am a professor, but I don't have a PhD. Now, I have to admit to you that many of my students, that, and I teach courses at the U, uh, teaching one now called Commodity Marketing with 60 students, and occasionally they will call me Dr. Russett, and I will admit right here and now that I don't even bother to correct. To start with, how important is it to have a grain marketing plan with set goals? Well, I, th- I think it's really important. I think having a, having a game plan is important in all aspects of life. And um, having a game plan for marketing is also very important. Even if you don't execute the plan, I'll tell people that writing a plan forces you to sit down, uh, look at your own situation, think about your cash flow needs, think about your production costs and go through the the exercise of, okay, what are my production costs on the farm? And all of that is a healthy exercise. It's almost like in writing a marketing plan, you're doing a little benchmarking of your own operation. What are my costs? How do they compare to my neighbors? These things should come up. So even if, even if you don't execute the plan, even if uh, the market doesn't give you an opportunity to execute the plan, which it has been difficult this last year. It's still a healthy exercise to go through, to write that plan. So Ed, uh, while we were preparing for this episode and looking at all the work, the great work that you've done in grain marketing, um, we see that one of the big take home messages that you have is is five common mistakes in grain marketing. Can you, can you say what those five common mistakes are and point uh, our listeners in a direction of where they can find more information about these mistakes? Okay. I'd be happy to. In fact, it has become sort of the most common talk I will give, and I update it every year. It's an idea, five common mistakes in marketing I came up with a little over 20 years ago when I started working with the university. I'll get to the five mistakes, but I'm going to be long-winded. 
I started work with the university coming from the private sector as a buyer and a grain trader. And I'm visiting with producers and I'm giving them outlook presentations and I show them pretty charts. I, and, and three reasons why the corn market might go up in the next few weeks and three reasons why the corn market might go down. You know, God bless and good luck. You know, and I realize that's not getting anywhere, but I'm listening to the producers and I realize they have some misconceptions about how the market works. They have some, you know, just uh, borderline ideas of what's happening. And this concept of, you know, if you would just quit making that mistake, you'd be a lot better. And in fact, this this idea of eliminating mistakes. Uh, I'm a guy, so I think in terms of sports analogies and, and think of your favorite football team and uh, think, of, think of how much better your favorite football team would be if they didn't jump off sides on third and short, if they didn't fumble the ball in the red zone, if they didn't draw a stupid interference call on defense uh, when they don't need it. How much better would a team be if they didn't make mistakes? And we all realize they'd be much better. You don't have to jump any higher, run any faster. In fact, it's a common theme in sports that your best teams, your most competitive teams year in and year out are teams that are fundamentally sound and don't make a lot of mistakes. So I came up with this idea of rather than try and predict the market, and because that's a hard thing to do, rather than predict the market, let's think about, well, these mistakes that I see happening. Look at yourself and ask yourself, am I making these mistakes? And if I eliminated them, would I lift my whole game up a little higher? So the five mistakes I identified in no particular order, but I present them this way, is one, the reluctance towards uh, pre-harvest marketing. And that is looking for early opportunities to price new crop grain. Now, I'll be the first to admit here in 2020, a pandemic-stricken year, uh, producers really didn't have very many good opportunities to price 2020 soybeans or corn last spring. You know, you'd have to go way back to uh, last December or even January of this year for something that looks like a reasonable opportunity. But I, I know producers who just will not price grain before harvest. And I'm like, that that's a mistake. Some of your best opportunities can happen before harvest. The second mistake, I'll tell producers, you got to know and understand your local basis. Now I'm talking to uh, people in the great state of Delaware and uh, you cheer for a blue hen, is that true? That's, that's hard to wrap my mind around. But I can't complain and I can't disrespect you because I cheer for a gopher and you know, I have no moral ground to stand on there. But anyway, <laughs> out in Delaware, you have a much better basis than in the Midwest. And uh, I, I note that today your corn basis in different parts of Delaware might be 20 over, 30 over, 40 over the December contract. And here we are 40 to 50 under in the great state of Minnesota. We're far from the market, basis is lower. All I'm telling people with basis is you gotta know and understand your local basis. You have to have an opinion on when basis is good, when it's not so good, and it becomes a part of your marketing decision. I have a hard time putting a, a number on, on the value of that, but you gotta know, you have to become a student of your local basis, understand the pattern. Basis has a pattern every year, it tends to be weak at harvest, strongest in the spring and or early summer. Know your pattern, know what's good, know what's bad. Third mistake, lack of an exit strategy. <laughs> I have this many times. I'll, I'll talk to a group of producers and, and it'll be January and I'll ask people, uh, okay, you put uh, your corn in the bins at harvest. Yeah, okay. And uh, the market is, uh, let's say it's up 20 cents since harvest. Uh, so when are you going to sell that grain? What's your exit strategy? Are you waiting for 40 cents more? Are you waiting for 50 cents more? What if it goes down? Do you have a time involved? And of course, there's a, you can hear crickets. No one has an answer to that. And I think it's a big problem. It, when you have unpriced grain in the bin, or even if you have hedged grain, you have to have an exit plan. When am I getting out of this? And uh, if you don't have one, 
if you don't if you don't like write it you can always adapt it but if you don't set it down on paper look at it and say yes i'm waiting for this price or this level of increase over the harvest price you 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 might just miss the opportunity you know this happens i <laughs> i tell producers i know what your exit plan is uh you've got corn in the bin and you want 25 cents more and i said now in the next two weeks if we get a 25 cent rally in corn what are you going to do and of course someone will pipe up and say well uh, i'm gonna wait for another 25 cents i said <laughs> that's the problem it's a moving target. So don't do that. Have an exit plan. Fourth mistake relates very closely to the lack of an exit plan. And that is, and it's a big problem in the upper Midwest where we have those cold winters and producers can store grain a long time. And the, the, that fourth mistake is holding grain too long. If you look at any seasonal pattern in corn and soybean prices, you will know that on average, prices are weakest at, are lowest at harvest. This is on average, every year is a little different, and highest in the spring or, or early summer. And yet we'll have producers, no exit plan, market gives them a little rally, and then, well, I'll wait for 25 cents more. And they continue holding grain into the summer. And son of a gun, they'll hold it right right through the whole crop year. They'll watch the bulge come. They'll watch the app. They'll pass on every opportunity. New crop comes. They still got last year's crop. And I've got a character, Hank Holder, who holds his grain to sell at the end of the crop year right before harvest. I know it's an extreme example. But Hank is my worst performing character and I've got about 15 or 20 make-believe uh, uh, celebrity producers. It's a bad deal. The last mistake is this misunderstanding the nature of carrying charges in the market and uh, it's kind of difficult to explain verbally but it's all about this strategy I hear producers talk about where my broker tells me I should sell my corn at harvest and reown with an option a call option so you sell at harvest and that harvest price is based on the December futures contract and yet the reownership is not with the December contract you want to get out there ahead so you might reown with the May or the July July corn contract. And the argument is I've avoided storage costs because you see, I sold my grain at harvest. I re owned it on paper. I have no grain in the bin, no storage costs. Well, if you understand what a carrying charge is in the market, you realize that particularly in corn, it is normal for the December contract to be trading lower than that July or May contract out in the year ahead. They often trade at a higher price, a positive carrying charge. You know what that positive carrying charge is? It is a market determined storage cost. So if you sell today at a lower based at a price based on that lower December contract and reown with the May or July contract that's trading higher, the mistake is you did not avoid storage costs. You paid them up front. You paid them up front. So the only time this paper farming makes sense is if the market is flat or inverted. That is to say, the July contract that you are reowning in is at the same price as the December contract, or maybe even lower. Now, that's a pretty rare occurrence in the corn market, not so rare in soybeans. And that's why it has a little better record in soybeans. So those are the five mistakes. I apologize for taking so long to explain them. But my point with producers is, which ones do you make? Which ones uh, do you make year in and year out? And if you eliminated them, how much better would you be off? How much would that improve your marketing? No, I, I think those five mistakes are um, are common, <laughs> hence the name. Uh, but one of the questions I have, I think it was um, mistake number two. Can you go a little bit more into explaining what basis is? Because you wouldn't, you need our producers to understand what local basis is. So can you just go in a little bit more depth of what that means? Well, basis, and this is the most complex math I'll lay on you uh, today. A uh, basis is, if you want to know your basis, you take your, your nearby cash price. What are you being bid for corn today? And subtract the nearby futures contract. 
So December corn, I'm gonna make up numbers, is currently about 365. I think we're close to that. And uh, nearby prices in Delaware, I just looked it up this morning, I saw bids as high as 35 over. In other words, the bid for new crop corn was $4 a bushel cash. And the nearby futures were 365, so you're 35 over the nearby market. 35 over the December contract. And again, uh, here in Minnesota, uh, we're trading 40 to 50 under. So we're being bid not four dollars, not three ninety to four dollars cash price today as you are. We're looking at three fifteen to three twenty-five in much of southern Minnesota. I'm not trying to uh, garner your pity. I'm just trying to give you an idea there. That's basis. Now, that's just a simple mathematical calculation, but what I'm telling people is basis has a pattern. The cash price tends to be at its lowest point relative to futures at harvest, and there's a reason for that. Harvest is a new crop. There's a lot of bushels chasing limited space. That's not Chicago, the, the uh, futures contract. The price of futures really don't care that farmers in southern Minnesota or in Delaware are having a hard time finding a home for their new crop corn. That's a very local issue, and that tends to impact the local price, but not necessarily the futures price, this world price of corn. But later in the crop year, you get beyond harvest, you know, you only produce one crop, so you have a certain stock of corn, soybeans, wheat that must be meted out over the year, and based on supply demand situations, that basis generally improves. Every year is a little different, but it tends to reach its highest point in the spring or late spring, early summer. In very tight carryout years, it can get pretty wild in the summer. And again, what I ask producers to do is get to know that local basis. What's a good one? What's a bad one. I like to tell producers in southern Minnesota, my home state, I say, you must have an opinion on basis. And if you don't have one, give me 20 bucks and I'll share mine. Become a student of that. Start tracking it. Write it down. Uh, there are resources out there to uh, get some history on. So Ed, you've talked about it a little bit, but can you go into a little more depth of the seasonal trends in grain prices? Well, uh, Cash uh, seasonal trends are, are very distinct in corn, soybeans, and even in wheat, less strong in wheat because you've got both winter and spring and it's spread out more. But in corn and soybeans, just about, and USDA puts out numbers, uh, corn prices in Iowa, Minnesota, and Nebraska, average monthly corn prices. I don't know if they do it for Delaware. Uh, they don't do it for every state. But if you look at the pattern for any Corn Belt state, cash prices for corn and soybeans tend to, on average, always, I want to say on average, every year is a little different, but over the long run, it would be at its lowest point in October. October and November would be the lowest prices. And then we start to rise. We start, we start to improve a bit as the crop year goes on. And the month of May or June is going to have your highest average corn and soybean price. And then it begins its descent, again, on average, uh, into the new crop year. This has been true. This pattern is driven by the production cycle. You know, we harvest in the fall and spring is a time of new crop tends to be better because farmers are planting grain. They aren't selling as much. Basis gets better by the way seasonal patterns are driven mostly by basis, not by futures. We should understand this. I mean, there are some truths there. Now, having said that, you've got listeners who are going to think, well, this means that every year I just put my grain in the bin and I wait until late spring, early summer, and I sell it. And I will tell you that, yeah, uh, if you do that every year, you'll come out okay. You won't win every year. And as a matter of fact, 2020 is a case in point. I've got a celebrity producer in my book her name is May Sellers. And May Sellers puts her corn and soybeans in the bin at harvest in mid-October in Minnesota 
language, and she holds on to that grain unpriced until the last week of May, hence her name, May Sellers. By the way, I could have named her June Sellers and had her sell in the first or second week of June, but I, I did what I did. And if I start, if I make up any more characters, people are going to haul me away. So we'll stick with May. Don't get hung up on the last week of May. The actual high might be in the first half of June. It's somewhere in there. I've got over 30 years of data, real data on May sellers using Iowa prices. And 2020 in the pandemic, this was May sellers' worst year in 30 years. In other words, the price at harvest, the price at the end of May in 2020, I want to say the cash price of corn, your listeners would know better, 30, 40, 50 cents less than the harvest price. Mm -hmm. All pandemic driven. And yet a harsh reminder that a simple strategy of putting it in the bin and, and going to sleep and not paying attention to it may not always be the best way to go. But those seasonal patterns do exist. I anticipate they will be true again in the year ahead. In other words, if I were a betting man, I would guess that cash prices will be better next May and June than they are right now. But it's not always true. The marketing is just its not quite that simple. Great, Ed. And uh, so how do we go about calculating production costs and our inputs, cost of inputs, any it have any relation to the cycles and, you know, the, the price of grain? Well, the way I would go about calculating a production cost, um, many, I don't know if uh, the University of Delaware does this, if maybe you have a spreadsheet or something that helps people calculate it. I'm going to suggest a website. It's called FinBin. It is, uh, it gathers real farm data from a number of states. And forgive me, I'm not sure if Delaware is participating in this. Minnesota and the Dakota, I think there are about 10 different states that participate. And we produce, FinBin gathers this data from real farm farms uh, uh, throughout the country. And with that, you can calculate production costs. And it'll, if you use, just go to Google FinBin, F-I-N, B-I-N. FinBin, it's out of the University of Minnesota and the Center for Farm Financial Management where I do my daily work. And you can calculate a cost of production. And if there aren't Delaware numbers there, use, use the Minnesota numbers, for example, not because they relate directly to you, but you'll get a printout and you'll see all the categories of expenses we look at. And now you can start going through your own farm and plugging in your own numbers and calculate a cost of production. Uh, do input costs affect that? Absolutely, they do. Uh, do they affect grain prices? Yes, over time they do. Day to day, probably not, but over time they do. I think it's a healthy exercise to calculate your cost of production, even healthier if you can get data on production costs in your area. And I always like to tell producers that uh, the Delaware producer probably should not expect to produce corn as cheaply as a an Iowa producer, okay? Iowa's got this land that's just made for corn and the yields are great and the land costs are cheaper. And yet that's not really the relevant issue. The relevant issue is, am I competitive with my neighbors? Corn and soybeans are commodity markets. And as I went through my lecture yesterday with my students, I think my job with a bunch of 20 year olds, I'm trying to help them understand why commodities are so different from, from any product, the cell phone they carry around, the shirt they wear on their back, computer they have, the car they drive, those are products. Products are branded, they're differentiated, you advertise them, you package them different. Not a commodity. Commodities are, none of that stuff matters. It's all about price. It's all about production costs. And if you want to be competitive in a commodity market, you must be an efficient low-cost producer. It's just a cruel world. I have been known to tell farmers uh, that I meet in southern Minnesota and times aren't so good. Uh, you know, I'll say you picked one hell of a way to make a living. This is not easy. But take those production costs. Don't worry about what we're doing in Minnesota or Iowa, but do worry about your neighbors in your area, in Delaware. Am I competitive? And if I'm not, why am I not competitive? Am I paying too much for inputs? Am I, am I, am I not not getting the yields I should, etc. Be competitive. You must, in a commodity market, the low-cost producer wins. 
You want to be efficient and competitive on cost. So we're talking about production costs. And in your five common mistakes of grain marketing, one is lack of exit strategy. So should we ever sell below our production cost? Is that involved in an exit strategy? Well, yeah, yeah. It doesn't seem to make sense. But of course, part of production costs, uh, your listeners have to think about, well, are you taking into account these For example, several programs made special payments to commodity producers. If you will, that kind of buys down your production costs. Today, December corn is at 365. That's not a number to write home about. Beats the hell out of the 320, 325 of a month ago, but it's still not a number to write home about. And if you think in terms of production costs only, you'll say, well, that that won't pay the bills. $4 cash corn in Delaware, that won't pay the bills. And I'll say, well, have you considered the payments you got because of the pandemic and that? Okay, does that add up now? Look at the whole picture. And the other reason you might sell below production costs is uh, this is commodities are a cruel world. They don't promise prices above production costs every year. And uh, sometimes the market is such, I would say over the last five years, unfortunately, it's been touch and go with prices relative to production costs. We get opportunities that show up for a short time and sometimes not. I tell producers, you know, sometimes you're maximizing profits and sometimes you have to you have to think about minimizing losses. You say, why would I sell corn knowing that I'm losing 20 cents a bushel? And my answer is because in a couple of months, you might be selling at uh, a loss of 50 cents a bushel. And those are hard choices. This is why it's a hard world in the world of corn and soybean production. But sometimes you have to bite the bullet and sell cheaper. So last year at Delaware Ag Week, uh, you gave a workshop titled How to Get $5 Corn. Can you remind listeners steps needed to succeed with this goal? And I think I still have a few of those books around. So if yeah. anybody listening needs one, I can I can distribute some. Well, uh, how to get here in the Midwest, it's titled How to Get $4 Corn. <laughs> but of course, you have a lot better basis than I can't recall, Jake, if it was you I was working with or someone else in your Blake or Dan, uh, someone, and I said, well, I've got a workshop, how to get $4 corn. And uh, at the, the response was something on the order of you're going to get run out of town to tell people how to get $4 corn. They've got it right now. Yeah, <laughs> because your basis is so much better. So we retitled it, how to get $5 corn, and uh, which had a little better ring in Delaware Delaware terms. It's a three-step process. You're going to start in Delaware terms. If you can make a sale of, uh, and by the way, don't get hung up on the one number and don't get hung up on the how to get $4 corn, how to get, uh, you know, what's the price? Yeah, price Price matters, but this workshop was really all about combining pre-harvest marketing efforts with post-harvest marketing efforts to get the most you can out of the market. So today, I'll tell you that uh, the opportunity is not there to get $5 corn on the 2020 crop. The 2021 crop, I'm going to guess I I would have to rename it something like how to get $4.75 corn. So I'll explain it. Three steps. Step one, make a price grain before harvest. If you want $5 corn, you're going to have to start at uh, probably 410 in the December 21 contract. And so, you know, some of your listeners are going to go right to the board right now and they're going to say, well, you idiot. It's not trading at 410. It's trading at 385, I believe. And I'll say, that's right, 25 cents less. So now we're going to rename it how to get 475 corn because that's your starting point. You start with that pricing and you're going to do that with a futures contract. And if you can't handle a futures contract, hopefully your local market uses hedge to arrive contract or futures fixed contracts. They go by different names. So you start with that. When you get to harvest, step two, you've got to roll that hedge from the December contract, which you would use the December 21 contract, out to the July of 2022. And people will always ask, well, okay, why didn't I just sell the July 22 contract in the first place? Why do it? Why why start in the December and roll to the July? And I've got data that shows that the December-July spread widens 
over time. Nine out of 10 years that that spread will widen and reach its widest point as you get close to harvest. And if you're starting this process of say in January of 2021, you're not going to have that wide spread. That's my reasoning. So that's step two. At harvest, you are going to put that grain in the bin. You've now rolled your hedge to the July, and now you're going to wait until the spring of 2022. I'm dealing now with the 21 crop, not the 20, the 21 crop. I'm always looking ahead. You're waiting for that basis to narrow up. There we are back on this basis talk. And uh, you're looking for a good opportunity to make the final sale, deliver on the hedge to arrive contract. By the way, many hedge to arrive contracts contracts, they will allow you to roll the hedge forward once within the same crop year. Please see your, whoever you're dealing with, your local market, make sure if they have a hedge to arrive contract, you have that alternative to roll the hedge forward. Not all of them do. And then you're going to wrap that up, you know, that you'll start at uh, 385 on the December contract. You'll add maybe 25 cents for the carry from December to July, December 21 to July of 22. That's uh, 25 cents more. Now you're up at a 410. And now what's your basis going to be in the spring of 2022? Out there in Delaware, it might be 50 over. So you got 410 plus 50, you're at 460 cash coin. It can be done. It can be done. I know producers who have been doing this in the upper Midwest, you know, People are lamenting, oh my God, uh, the cash price of corn is uh, 350 or 330 or 320. And yet there are people who ended up with $4 doing this this process. Do you have a celebrity character who does this? I did create some for the game. And yes, I do have some celebrity characters that do it, who have done it every year. Again, I, I don't want people to get hung up on the number, you know, how to get $4 corn, how to get $5 corn. It's really a story of how to combine pre and post harvest marketing in a fundamentally sound way that gets you a better price. By the way, if you do this approach and the great bull market of 2021 begins for whatever reason, <laughs> you know what that means. You're going you're to say, oh, that, that son, of, son of a gun. I won't swear. <laughs> Son of a gun from the university convinced me to go down this route to get uh, 460 or 470 or 480 corn, and my neighbor's selling at 590. Yeah, that can happen. That can happen. So, Ed, I imagine we're just scratching the surface of grain marketing with this episode. And one of the things we like to do is provide our listeners with some opportunities to go look for more information on these topics. Can you talk about your latest book? The uh, grain marketing is simple, it's just not easy. Well, my latest book is from frankly, my only book, but it is the second edition that's out there right now. The original uh, uh, edition came out in 2007. The second edition was published late in 2015, so it's uh, not quite five years old. The name of it is Grain Marketing is Simple. It's just not easy. And if you want a copy, Google it. You, can, you won't get it at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. Somebody might be reselling a used copy. I've heard people, uh, I've occasionally received an email, someone selling your first edition for $80. Well, you can do that if you want people, but if you Google it and go to the U of M website where it is available, you'll pay $40, $39.95, and that includes shipping in it. We make it uh, available. We sell it ourselves. So Google it, find it. Everything I've talked about here today is included in that book. I'm happy to say that I believe between the two editions, we've got something like uh, 13,000 plus copies out there over the last decade. So it's a good resource. It sounds uh, very self-aggrandizing for me to plug my own book. Uh, uh, producers think, yeah, the son of a gun's going to buy himself uh, a new cell phone on my hard-earned money. I want you to all know that all of the money goes to the University of Minnesota, not to me. I'm still low PO'd about the whole deal, but, you know, that's just the way it is. Jake sent us a video of your a conference you did, a talk you did on the five common mistakes. Okay. They can Google that as well. If Jake could put that to Katie to put up on our website. And also you yeah. talked about, during that video, you talked about the commodity challenge. I thought that was pretty neat for people that are interested in this grain marketing, but don't yes. really have, want to put their own coin in the, in the mix right yet, but they can practice. Can you just give us a little 
idea about that? Well, Commodity Challenge is a website that we've, uh, it's a trading, a, a trading simulation, but all the numbers are real, real cash prices, real futures prices and options prices. And it's uh, free because we get support from the CHS Foundation. And it's what you do is if you go to commoditychallenge.com, all one word, commoditychallenge.com. You, you register on the site. we got nothing to sell you. Don't worry about getting emails from us trying to sell you something. But you can join an open game. I've always got a ton of open games on there. Or if you want, uh, and I suggest this to friends here with the University of Delaware, you can set up a game. I will get local quotes. What's fun about the game, it's customizable. So I can create a game and I can get quotes for corn bids in Delaware, soybean bids in Delaware. So you're not, so you play the game as a Delaware producer and you can practice some strategies. Buy puts, you can sell futures, you can simply sell cash grain. You're given so many bushels to market over the course of a time period and you can practice. Try these things out and all the numbers are real, but uh, no one gets hurt. Yeah, I, I like that, Jake. We should look into that, Blake. We should try to figure out if we can get a Delaware team. By the way, uh, last couple of years, I'm starting 250 games a year throughout the country, 25 different states. It's very popular with high school ag classes. It's popular with community college ag classes. It's popular. I used it in my own University of Minnesota class because nothing beats, you can talk about grain markets all you want, but nothing beats experience of having to make those pricing decisions. Thanks, Ed. Um, do you have any take-home messages you want to leave us with? Well, I'm just thinking of the current market, and uh, you know, I don't do Outlook a lot, but uh, I don't know how many of your listeners realize that yesterday, on September 14th, November 20 soybean futures topped out at 10.08 and three quarters, and that was a life of contract high. Uh, the highest it's been, you know, it hung around the high nine dollar mark, nine seventy. 9980 early this year. But three years ago, it got as high as 1005. And uh, we set a life of contract high. The corn market, not as impressive at 365, but still 40 cents off at lows, off its lows. And I always like to remind producers that when someone, uh, yeah, when the cookie jar is being passed around the room and there's an opportunity to grab a cookie, don't forget to put your hand in the cookie jar and grab it. <laughs> and there's an opportunity here in this rally. I don't know how high it'll go. Will it go higher? Possibly. But this is a hell of a rally off its lows particularly on soybeans, but even wheat and corn have had a little bounce. And if you've been behind on making pricing decisions, uh, here's a chance to catch up on a few. What's driving that soybean rally right now? Uh, we, but we've got uh, two things going on, uh, both positive. We've simply got good demand in the grain markets. Uh, soybean exports and corn exports are running better than anticipated, better than a year ago. And strong demand is always a good thing. And you have on top of that, uh, it's going to be a very good crop, but it's not going to be the bin buster that we thought about just two months ago. Uh, you know, USDA trimmed its thoughts on uh, corn yields nationwide and soybean yields in the last report. We've got some dryness in parts of Iowa. We had something called a derecho go through Iowa uh, in, in early August and took a lot of, you know, you, if you look at the last WASDU report, USDA took some acres out of harvested acres for corn, their anticipated harvest acres. And you might say, why would they change that? And I'd say, come with me to central Iowa and I'll show you some corn that's not going to be harvested. It's laying flat. So we've had some things on the supply side in addition to good demand that just puts a little different spin on this market. But again, let's not just get all bold up and, and uh, stubborn. This is a great opportunity to catch up on some sales that you wish you'd made months ago. Well, thank you for joining us. I know I've learned a lot and it's a pretty complex topic. So like Blake said, we really just started 
scratching the surface here. So sure. uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And, thank you, uh, sir. Uh, you have to tell me the Gophers are part of the Big Ten and the football season's been called off. Are the Blue Hens playing? Not this fall, no. Okay. They, yeah, I think, South they're playing. Yeah, yeah, I think there's talk of maybe a spring, but okay. uh, I don't know. And it, you know how it is, 2020, everything changes day to day. Okay. Well, maybe someday we'll see a blue hen and a gopher go at it, and I'm not sure if I can wrap my mind around that. Um, I don't know if we want to see that. <laughs> no. Well, thanks again for having me on. I've, I've, I've enjoyed my time here. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Take care. Yep. See you. This podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by both guests and hosts are their own, and their appearance on this program does not imply endorsement by the University of Delaware or UD Cooperative Extension. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode and we'll come back for more. In the meantime, please subscribe, visit us online at udel.edu slash extension, and join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at UD Extension. This program is brought to you by the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension, a service of the UD College of Agriculture and Natural Resources, a land-grant institution. This institution is an equal opportunity provider.